Um, so today we have um, as a topic broadcast channels um, and then at the very end of the day just an introduction to multiple access channels. Um, just as a quick review um, what we uh, looked at up to now. So the first problem we looked at was a source coding problem and that was the distributed source coding problem where we have two sequences coming out of a discrete memoryless source and we have two encoders, encoder 1 and encoder 2 that compress um, to NR1 bits and NR2 bits. Uh, there's a centralized uh, fusion center, if you like, um, but anyway, a centralized processor that gets these bits and um, tries to reconstruct the sequences at the input um, exactly. So that's the idea here. This is a lossless problem and what we saw is that the um, rates that we require to do that reconstruction have the following form. R1 has to be bigger than the entropy of x given y. R2 has to be bigger than the entropy of y given x. And the sum has to be bigger than the joint entropy. So what was um, interesting about that, of course, is that this number is less than the entropy of x, less than the entropy of y. So anyway, if we draw this, what we saw was that if we plot the set of rates that we can work with here, not that I drew that very well, then we have the following. So this here is the entropy of y given x. This here is the entropy of x given y. This is the entropy of x and this is the entropy of y. And if we didn't use uh, a good coding, we would have achieved only this point right here, right? So the key here was that we do hashing. So effectively what we're doing is we um, I, I liked to draw that as sort of a separation uh, based encoding. The first thing we can do is index the sequences, the set of typical sequences, so to compress it down to h of x bits. But then we actually compress further, let's say to here, right? And we do the same thing here, and as long as we choose the compression rates, um, in such a way we can approach points on the boundary of that line, right, which is somewhat remarkable. So here we have an indexing we do first and then after that we have a hashing. And if the receiver, the decoder uses, is, uh, uses a good decoder to undo this, then we can approach any point on this boundary, which is somewhat remarkable because we're getting the same rates <clears throat> as if both encoders were cooperating. And so this was a very big surprise back in around 1972 or 3 when this was first discovered. So this was the a paper by Slepi and Wolf. I think it was, I'm not even sure what year it was. I should have it in my notes. Either, I think it's 72 or 73. 1973. 1973. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this paper, so it was a paper in the IEEE Transactions on Information Theory back in 1973. It won the Information Theory Society Paper Award, I guess 1974, 75. I'm not sure how regularly they did that back then. Um, and what's also interesting about this paper is that it didn't approach it the way we did. It really was focusing on the corner points and what it was using was using, so one of, if you're looking at the corner points, of course you're not, if this, it's this corner point, then we don't need any hashing here, so that's just a pure compression. And what they used here then though to compress further from h of x down to h of y given x was a um, linear code. So they were working with linear codes there. And this insight um, I mentioned, you know, is kind of interesting because the way you, 
do hashing usually is once you have this index, uh, maybe we can call it here, suppose this was the index, it's a bit vector, let's say it's B2 that comes out of the indexing, right, so suppose it's a linear coding with parity check matrix. H, uh, and suppose, uh, um, I guess I want Xn, Xn was indexed to NH of X bits, so let's just call the vector B1, then what we actually transmit will be W1 as a vector, we'll just could for instance be B1 times H. And if you choose H to be the um, capa capacity achieving code, um, well, here I guess I have to be a little bit more careful how, how I talk about that, but effectively it's as if you, um, you know, had the, the X's going through to the Y's. We see the Y's perfectly because we can undo this compression so the receiver sees the Y. That's like observing a noisy channel output. And then these bits tell you what coset that you're in in the code. So the code, um, the code just has to be good for it, for the case where these cosets were all zero, which would be the basic parity check equation. But since all cosets are just as good, you know, we're getting the coset and just decode the way we do for the basic code because the performance has to be just as good. So anyway, the, this is the kind of stuff they were doing in their paper. It's what usually it's very well worth reading always the original papers because they're usually described really simply, right? Because they're just trying to figure stuff out. Usually later we think that simple is bad. You always have to add something more so the papers get more and more complicated all the time so that nobody can understand them anymore. It's true though, right? I mean, you think we've all had that experience. And so in the end they tend to be um, more difficult to learn from the later papers. Okay, so that's the first topic we um, discussed. We then looked at another source coding problem um, where what we did is we actually passed Y to the decoder. So that's interesting. So, you know, I mean, I, I mentioned that, um, so let me draw this first. So it's the same kind of situation we just talked about for this corner point. The only thing now is we try to make it a little bit more challenging by um, permitting distortions. So, and I mentioned that's an interesting right. So that this situation, if I draw it, it kind of corresponds just to that corner point. So we even know what the answer is now to if, if there was no distortion permitted on X, we know we could compress down to H of X given Y. Right? That's just that point. Um, of course, you know, now we get back, to, now of course we can shift to the problem and say, okay, what's the region when, there, um, when there's distortions? And I mentioned that that problem is still unsolved in general. It turns out it is solved um, if both sources are Gaussian. That was actually a relatively recent um, result, I think from around 10 years ago only, 2008 or something maybe a little bit sooner. The, the pe there was this problem called the CEO problem, which is when these two are noisy versions of, let's say, suppose this is a noisy version of that, that's another noisy version of that, and suppose we want to reconstruct the V at the receiver, right? That's something called the CEO problem, the chief executive officer problem, because you view V as being some information. There's two agents the CEO sends out, maybe his vice presidents, they gather some information, they compress the data to help the CEO understand, and the CEO makes an estimate of what, you know, originally happened. That was sort of the motivation for giving this name to this problem. But, um, so this problem was solved also for the Gaussian case around in the, about 10 years ago, not so long ago, 12 years ago by Uhama. And then there was work at Berkeley, um, with Aaron, I guess, who was it? Aaron Wagner, I think already then they solved it too, but they were a little bit later. But I mean, I think that work then led to the solving of the Gaussian case. And it turns out the tools that were needed were not really that 
complicated. There were tools that were already known. There wasn't a new tool needed, no, but you had to put it together in the right way. That, I mean, that was the challenge. But still, it's interesting. So for the Gaussian case, uh, the problem is solved. But in general, it's not. Okay, it's still an open problem. Um, however, in some special cases, it turns out the problem was is solvable, like this one here for the general sources and distortion function. So now we add a distortion function, uh, namely d and x, x hat. And if we sum these over all i equals 1 to n, then we require that to be less than n times d. Right? So that's the distortion measure we use. And we found out that after doing similar uh, kind of idea, namely, here we have first a vector quantizer followed by a hashing. Then we can also achieve the optimal rate, and that was what we call the Reiner's of rate distortion function, which has a little bit of a complicated form because of the minimization, but anyway, it was I. What we do is we first do a vector quantization where we generate an auxiliary random variable u. Then we try to find, given the x, we try to find a u in the code book that's typical, that requires at least that much bits and then we hash and so we can reduce the rate further but the amount we can reduce it by requires decoding of the u given what the receiver knows yn and the message so we got this rate where the minimization is over an auxiliary random variable a uh, channel u that we generate from x and a function f such that the expected value of this distortion function d that we're choosing of uh, x and f of u, y, the two things the receiver knows is less than or equal to d. And I also like to always emphasize that u, uh, y, x, u has to form a Markov chain. It's Markov. So there's a lot of extra little conditions we have to consider here in this optimization, but there it is. I mean, it's, it's actually quite remarkable um, that for any statistics you have here, and you can't forget, I mean, that can be very sophisticated because you're allowing any x, any y, so these could be long vectors, right? They could be any, it basically solves a very general class of problem with a nice single letter solution. So it's, it's like Shannon's theorem for the channel. I mean, it's, I think it's sometimes hard to appreciate how general Shannon's theory is because it looks so simple. You have i, x, y, but then you, once you start playing with applications, you realize, you know, this applies to th things with a lot of memory. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's, a, it's remarkable how general it is. The same thing is true here. It's a very general uh, statement that we have. Right, so um, the most important insight perhaps, though, is how you build your boxes again. The encoder is a uh, layered object, first vector quantization followed by hashing. So indexing, it's the same thing as indexing. It's just, you know, indexing in terms of quantization to, to get a distortion result. And then after you get the bit string, you hash it down. Okay, that's the architecture that is suggested by this. Right. That also tells you that if we did have this problem again, probably the natural approach to take is, well, VQ, <laughs> VQ hash, right? And that has been done, so that approach, this is called the Berger tongue problem, because I guess one of Toby Berger's students' tongue did this for his PhD, he got that problem. The, well, of course, the first thing they did was just mimic the weiner ziv coding, they derived certain rate regions and out, inner bounds, outer bounds, but they don't match. So only for some special channels do they match. In particular, they match for Gaussian sources by using the entry power inequality and a trick of Ozero that he used to solve the multiple description problem, Gaussian multiple description problem. Okay, uh, that was the source coding results that we needed. So the most important thing for us is really almost the hashing. So here, here we learned about hashing, here we learned about auxiliary random variables, right? So that was the main um, message of these two parts.
Um, so the next, the last topic we discussed was now a channel coding problem. So all this is sort of building up to the broadcast channel in a way, everything that we're doing. We looked at a problem of um, reliable communications where we had a message source which puts out a message with NR bits and we have an encoder, we have a channel and what was different about this channel is that it happened to be um, governed by a state. Otherwise the problem was the same as what you, we know from channel coding and this state we modeled it as an IID sequence of uh, um, symbols. So for example, we talked about you know, uh, Y equals X plus S plus Z a lot, but you could also have this being a fading, right? So eight S X plus Z or, or whatever you like, right? It's a very general kind of setup. State can mean many things. Here it means interference, here it means a fading variable. What's interesting though is that this fading is non-causally available, um, which makes the problem interesting. Um, and it's only available to the encoder. Uh, if, so if you um, had this available to both, then you would get the solutions, especially this one's interesting. This one's easy, you subtract off the S. This one's also interesting because it then just becomes a water filling over time. It's the same as if this was a frequency domain result, right? It's then just like having an OFDM signal that's just water filling over frequency. It doesn't really matter which way you look at it, right? Before you transform more time. Um, right. So what makes it interesting is this, is that it's available only to the encoder and that it's non-causal. Shannon looked at this problem with causal state information at the transmitter, right? And he solved the problem there. It turns out you, it's a little bit easier. Well, although even there you get some interesting results coming out. <laughs> it's kind of interesting the, what you do when you get the like, causal uh, state information. So we looked at this problem and what we did was um, we used the same coding method as for the Weiner Ziv problem. So we defined an auxiliary random variable u. So we built up a code book of u's here. And if I draw it again, this code book of use, we have many code books, right? And in particular, like if we look at the double youth code book, sub code book, that corresponds to the message W, uh, we have some size to the NR primed, we said. You, you won't really see it, but this is sub code book belonging to for, um, W equals W, right? So what you do is the message chooses a subcode book and then you try to find a U in here that's typical with S. That was the strategy. And then you send that, um, then you generate X using a function from the U and the S. You send that X and then you try to decode everything and you throw out the second parameter and keep only the first. And what we saw was that the gelfan pinsker rate and here we didn't have a cost constraint, so I didn't, anyway, I mentioned that a few times. The important thing here is the decoding requires you to decode um, U, and then you lose some rate because you have to choose a certain code book size, and that turns out to be a vector quantization problem, so we wound up with this. And the maximization is overall PUS and functions F, um, functions f such that x is f of u s and so u s x y is Markov that chain. So those were all the special conditions we had. And if there was a cost constraint here, so if I required that the uh, power here was limited, I would add that to here like then I would say uh, the optimization is constrained to require that E of the cost, some cost functions of X on X and Y is less than or equal to uh, some, let's say, power constraint or something like this, you know, some constraint, right? 
So we didn't cover that, but you can forget it. But anyway, if we add it in, it looks like really perfectly like this problem, just that the minimization becomes a maximization. And otherwise, the form is the same. And the reason the form is the same is that here you're again doing, there's a, there's a, here you're, the encoder actually involves a vector quantization, right? It, it involves choosing a whole set of code words rather than just one code word, a whole set. And then from that set, we still choose a sub something underneath, which basically involves vector quantization. So there's actually two steps here. There's both an encoding and a vector quantization happening at the same time simultaneously, right? The encoding is by choosing the subset of code words. Vector quantization is choosing one of them inside the set. And uh, I mentioned there are there's work still going on on this problem today. Partially, we'll see why today when we talk about broadcast channels. Right. Um, you would oh, uh, the, maybe call this. I, I, it's usually I have that. Let, let, let. Which information would you and S? Oh, I apologize. Yes, yes, yes. I was still thinking the S. Yes, thank you. And I shouldn't have used S here. Maybe I'll use a C. I don't like C either because that's cost. <laughs> I don't know. Some, it, it should be just some cost function. I'll, I'll use C and I'll just use a power constraint of some kind. Yeah, thank you. US, yes, thank you. Okay, and the other remarkable result we talked about was for the Gaussian case. So for this problem here, we saw that you could actually remove the interference completely. Okay, that's also interesting. So that the capacity for this case, right, of uh, the y equals x plus s plus z, where this here was a normal random variable with zero mean variance n. This was any random variable with finite variance. Finite variance. In particular, it could be some sequence that is just any sequence you like. So it doesn't have to have Gaussian statistics or anything like that. And there's a power constraint on a block power constraint on the xi, right? Then we found that this capacity was just one half log of one plus p by n, right? So we can get rid of the interference completely. Again, really surprising result that that should be possible. I think this is known as a dirty paper coding result, this one here. The Gaussian one. So this is called dirty paper coding. And was became really popular in the early 2000s, so maybe 15 years ago, through a paper by Shamai, uh, Kair and Shamai, on uh, vector broadcast channels, on MIMO broadcast channels, because there was a lot of interest in MIMO at the time, and uh, they realized that. Um, this result of Costa turns out to be quite important or useful for this problem. So today is devoted primarily to the um, broadcast channel. So let's start by talking a little bit about broadcast channels. First of all, the model, some motivations. Um, why? People are so interested in this topic, and there's a lot of interest, especially from industry. There's been enormous interest on this topic in the last uh, 15 years. Um, so there's a good reason, because of course there's a lot of um, applications associated with designing base stations, especially because usually base stations, you don't really worry about their pow how much power they consume, unless you have lots of them. And of course, nowadays, we're getting to the situation where we have lots of base stations and more and more. So the power consumption is starting to become of interest of base stations more and more. Also, the processing power. So it's starting to become important to simplify things, uh, not only to build really good things. But the initial motivation for focusing so much on broadcast channels, I think, is because, first of all, the big companies, what do they mainly sell? The highest margin products aren't your cell phone. <laughs> But the base stations, you have a, used to have a higher margin, so you can make more money on the same amount of stuff you sell. But of course, that's been changing, because base stations have been getting cheaper and cheaper, too. But anyway, let's look at broadcast channels. Very fascinating topic that people today are still working on. There's a lot of research activity on 
these problems today, especially massive MIMO. So broadcast channels with many, many antennas and where because you have so many antennas, you have to really have to worry about complexity, right? So there's been a ton, <laughs> quite a lot of papers in the last little while talking about uh, either, you know, how to, how to reduce the number of radio frequency chains of a multi-antenna transmitter or perhaps using highly quantized antenna, like quantized antennas, so to avoid the power amplifiers that are too expensive, stuff like that. But really a lot of papers are coming out, uh, you know, there's usually several every week on these topics, even today. Okay, so the, w what we want to look at is something called the two receiver broadcast channel. So it's the um, simplest um, type of broadcast channel in that sense. So what we have is we have an encoder that transmits some waveform that we represent by um, a sequence and the broadcast channel is defined by a conditional probability distribution. So there's two outputs here, one waveform for receiver one and one waveform for receiver two that we represent via discrete, via discrete representation. For example, I mean, it could be matched filter samples or it could be if the, usually we view these signals as being band limited functions. So we sample at the Nyquist rate, but you can equally well just say we're orthogonalizing the set of signals and then we also get a discrete representation. And what's interesting here is, first of all, usually when you're thinking of broadcast channels, you're thinking of sending one message with NR0 bits, let's say, to both receivers, right? That's the usual thing that we think of, I think, when we talk about broadcast channels. So here's the estimate at receiver one, and here's the estimate at receiver two. So most times when people hear the word broadcast channels, they think of this. and um, people are especially confused <laughs> sometimes who aren't so familiar with the information theoretic uh, terminology when they suddenly see two more messages or maybe only these two messages even. And here now we're talking about the case where there's two dedicated messages, one W1 and the other W2 with R rate R1 and R2. All right, so this one here is destined for this guy. And this one here is destined for this guy. Okay, so that's the uh, model and the problem is to find the set of rate triples. Find set of rate triples, R0, R1, R2, for which for sufficiently large n there is an encoder and decoders so that the error probability which we're here defining as the probability that the quadruple w hat 1, w hat 2, w1 hat, w2 hat, so being very formal here is not equal to w naught, w naught w1, w2 uh, is uh, below, is, uh, is uh, as small as desired. So of course, every time we set a target error probability, that's how you would usually design this in um, practical setting you would get a target error probability perhaps for every one of the messages individually or perhaps here we're look, just looking at the whole thing and then we want to find one encoder and one pair of decoders that satisfies this constraint. That's our problem that we have. Um, so the broadcast channel is often studied in the information theory or communications literature without the common message, right? So that you just have um, uh, the two private messages and usually when people see that problem and haven't heard the terminology they get confused about this terminology broadcast channel but okay that's just the terminology that's usually used. There's three messages. Um, now there's many variations on this problem for example um, you might think you know some people call these private messages uh, 
uh, that kind of language suggests that receiver two shouldn't be able to, you know, get the first message and receiver one shouldn't be able to get the second message, right? So there's a secrecy constraint of some kind when you hear the word privacy. Um, now that isn't required in our problem. In our problem, we're fine if everyone decodes everything. If that's the best approach, so be it, right? I mean, we, we trust the receivers even if they decode the other messages. If you don't trust them, well, fine, encrypt it, you know, and then you still do it this way. That's probably the most efficient way to do it. But if you're, if you're thinking about physical layer security, so keyless secrecy, then this problem is quite interesting, actually. This problem here where W1 has to be secret to W2 to receiver 2 and that W2 is secret to user 1. There's interesting, it's interesting to think about methods how to accomplish that. You can, so you can accomplish it in some cases. In some cases you can. Okay, um, so since this is a region, a triple, so generally it's going to be a three-dimensional region. Let's just draw what this might look like. R1, R2. Or not, right? So you'd probably think there's something like a region that looks like this, and then we have to find this surface, right? That's what we're after, the ultimate surface of this problem. So this problem is not solved uh, today. Um, it is solved for the um, Gaussian problem. It's, it was solved for the uh, scalar Gaussian problem uh, way back when. So uh, Tom, this was, you know, this was the first, I think, well, okay, I shouldn't quite say that. So Tom Cover had already had some nice results in his PhD thesis on classification, which has become popular again due to all the machine learning applications, but he was already doing classifiers back in the mid-60s. Um, but this problem, I think, made him well known in the information theory community as a young assistant professor or PhD student. I'm not sure when he exactly developed it, but it was 1972. And in his paper, he developed the model, he developed some basic theory, but he didn't prove um, capacity results yet, other than for really simple special cases. For example, the capacity result for the scalar Gaussian case was not yet in his paper, but he suggested what the solution was, and, and we'll go through uh, that. The proof for that solution only came with one of his PhD students at Bergman's, so he published a paper later proving that the what Tom Cover had done in his paper was actually the capacity region, the superpositions coding scheme we'll talk about. Um, in the 2000s, so this was already solved in the 19, early 1970s. For the vector Gaussian case, uh, oh, and by the way, the key in getting the solution here was you, to use Shannon's entropy power inequality which is also interesting because entry, Shannon's entry power inequality, as far as I know, hadn't really been used for much until then. <laughs> and so the, this was one, at least certainly one of, if not the first, one of the first applications of Shannon's entry power inequality to prove that what the, that superposition coding achieves the capacity of the scalar Gaussian broadcast channel. This, this, uh, the broadcast channel also led to Mrs. Gerber's lemma. I, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about that, but anyway. So, but in the early, two th in the late 90s, right, there was a lot of attention on MIMO, a lot of excitement 20 years ago, starting 20 years ago with the uh, discovery that, you know, capacity can scale with the number of antennas, right? So if here we have, um, you know, if we have two users and we have two antennas here, one antenna here and one antenna here, well, then we can actually get a better capacity scaling than if we had only one antenna everywhere. So you wanted the number of antennas, the number of antennas here and the total number of antennas here to match, and then you can get the best possible capacity scaling. That's what you needed. So there's a lot of excitement about that. However, there was no there was theory available. The theory will develop here, but it, nobody, it, it was difficult, seemed difficult to prove that um, the methods that were there achieved the capacity of vector Gaussian broadcast channels. Because the entry power inequality somehow wasn't enough, and superposition coding somehow wasn't enough. And in fact, um, this is where, you know, the paper I mentioned, this dirty paper coding came in. It was, they were at first able to show gradually people started understanding this problem better. The vector Gaussian case. Uh, first, the sum rate capacity was found if you, the, there is no common message. Then four years later, 
this case was solved without a common message and it was shown you needed to use this vector, these vector quantization steps we'll talk about. And then nobody was able to solve it with all three until like th three or four years ago, right? And so all these papers were recognized by some paper prizes every step of the way. It was a sort of a gradual one step after the other. Uh, solutions with new tools needed, especially for the recent results. Um, so Chandra and Ayer's uh, work on, uh, was able to solve the, the case with a common message too. But new tools seemed to be necessary. So I, I'm emphasizing all this historically a little bit because just to emphasize that there's a lot of work going on on this right now still. Um, and otherwise the problem is still open. We have um, certain achievable regions, we have certain outer bounds. Some people believe the achievable regions we have are optimal, some don't. <laughs> but you know, we don't really know. So it's one of the most outstanding open problems in um, information theory. If you could solve the broadcast channel in the sense of showing, let's say, that Martin's coding region or some variation of it is optimal, uh, you would get quite well known. <laughs> it's of interest to, of course, many uh, people, this problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing that we did for distributed source coding. We want to look at some special cases where the problem is solved and we'll see that the tools we need are quite interesting um, and from that we're, we build up our um, hope to understand or learn um, what the capacity region is of broadcast channels. Okay, so the capacity region is the closure uh, of this region, so that I should add that, so capacity. region, so this is, that's what we're looking for is this region here, capacity region. C is the closure, you know, includes the limit points just to make sure the set is closed, that, that's, that's all, of the set of these rate triples, R0, R1, R2, okay, so that's the capacity region. Okay, so let's talk about a few properties. Um, these, the first of these properties appears already in Tom Cover's paper. Uh, one first important property that was very useful for uh, making progress uh, 25 years later on the vector case was that the capacity region uh, depends only on it's probably the most basic property to know on the marginals. So what do I mean by the marginals on PXY and PY? Two given X. Okay, that's the first statement. Now, so why is this true? Why does the why does the joint why does the joint do the joint statistics don't matter? Well, the reason will be, and I'll just quickly walk through how you prove this, is that decoder one only sees Y1N, right? And decoder two sees only Y2N. So somehow in the decoding process, you never can use in any way the joint statistics. The transmitter somehow could, so it's not quite so obvious, right? But the receivers can't use it. Um, so one way of showing this is just to show, it's just to show that. Suppose we built a maximum likelihood receiver here. Well, that will only depend on PY1 given X right, the ML decoder, and same one here, so that already tells you the maximum likelihood decoding, you know, you won't change. You, so even if I change this channel, I'll always get the same, the joint statistics, as long as the marginals re remain the same, I'll always get the same error probability, right? And that already shows you the capacity regions of all of the situations are the same, right? But formally, you can go through certain steps. We can define the error probability at receiver one to be uh, probability of the event E1, where E1 is, of course, the event that this is not equal to W not W1. That's the error event at receiver 1. Similarly, PE2 is probability of E2, you know, where E2 is defined similar. Let me and the point is that this set depends only, it's basically just 
saying again what I said, depends only on PY1 unit. This event or set depends only on PY2 doing it. And so if we look at the overall error probability, which is there, of course, this is the probability of E1 or E2. Then we can say, well, that's less than or equal to the uh, <coughs> probability of E1 plus probability E2 by the union bound. And this thing here is bigger than or equal to the max of PE1, PE2. So um, that means the error probability is small if and only if both um, um, PE1 and PE2 are small at the same time. So that's one way of just saying, okay, we, the, way, the only way to make this error probability small is if we might make both individual error probabilities small, okay? But effectively, the way to think of this is, yeah, if, you, if I build the decoder here, decoder here, and then I've changed the joint statistics, obviously I'm going to get the same error probability for all channels in that set. So that means that for if I build a code and change the statistics, I'll always get the same error probability. So if I can approach a boundary point for one channel in the set, I can approach it for any of them in the set. And so, yeah. That means past regions are the same. So that's a, it's a useful statement. We'll see why it's useful. It helps us do theory, and it also actually gives us bounds. So we'll see that. Okay, a second result um, I need to use. So that's one property um, that we have. There's another property given in the course notes, which I don't want to emphasize here. It's not quite as crucial. So this was already in Tom Cover's paper. Um, a second result I want to um, at least write out is a result we'll need later when we do our uh, binning. So let's consider again, so this is sometimes called uh, binning or Martin coding. Uh, Catalin Martin was the um, a researcher in uh, Imre Chizar's, um, I, I'm not sure whose lab, I guess the Renier lab in Hungary. Um, um, she, was work, she worked a lot. She's a com more of a combinatoric uh, researcher, mathematician. She works, uh, worked closely with, I think she's one of the students of Imre Chizar's, and she worked closely with Janusz Kerner as well a lot. So they had several very important papers in the 70s, late, early 70s, late 70s. Um, and sometimes what I'm about to say is called Martin coding because the method first appeared in a paper by her in um, around 1978. Um, some, so in the cover, uh, in the El Kamal Kim book, this method is, has now been called multi coding. So if you run across the word multi coding, it's all the same, all this stuff. That's a new, new word for. Um, what we're talking about. So let's consider the Slepian Wolf coding that we did. Okay, so in fact the code construction is the same as what we did with Slepian Wolf coding. If you remember what we did with Slepian Wolf coding, we had, um, you know, this approach where we had um, this, this, these bins on X, right? So here we had um, um, message w equals 1, and we had all of these x and w, uh, 1 comma v, where we ran over all the v's. Then the second code book, uh, x superscript n, my apologies, uh, it's a vector. So the x n 2 over all v's, so this here is w equals 2, and so on. And we did the same thing for x, and we did the same thing for y, right? So let's just consider um, so with code words, with code words, 
x and w1 comma v1. I guess I should put here w1, v1, and y n w2, v2. Okay, so suppose we just consider that for the moment. Um, now you'll remember what we did with Sleppy and Wolf coding is we first, every one of the distributed encoders, one of them transmits W1 to the receiver, and one of them transmits W2 to the receiver. So the receiver knows that I ha he has, to, let's say W1 was two, the receiver will know I must look into this subcode book and similarly, the receiver knows he has to look into some subcode book for receiver uh, for the encoder two, right? So you have two subcode books you're looking at, and in the, so let me just draw that the way I drew it yesterday. So here's all the code books X and W one down to X and W uh, two to, uh, one W one two to the n R one primed, and here we have Y n. W2, 1, all the way up to Yn, W2, uh, to the n, R2 primed. Okay, so I have all these code words. Okay, so all the receiver knows, just given the indices W1 and W2, is that the actual pair that the source put out is is inside this set, right? Every one of these um, boxes represents a possible pair that the source could have put, in, uh, put out, but we know because that there was correlation in the source, we know that not all boxes are possible because not all boxes have jointly typical pairs, right? And as long as we don't choose the box too big in size, there's only gonna be one jointly typical pair inside, right? Maybe this one. Right? And if that happens, that there's only one inside, we're happy because we've now found, the receiver has found the um, right pair, which is what was the problem was for the Slepping Wolf coding problem. Now suppose we turn the problem around. Remember what we did for gelfand pinsker coding? For gelfand pinsker coding, these indices, the index W wasn't a result of some compression, it was given ahead of time, right? It's what we're trying to transmit. So suppose that we turn the problem around now and we say, no, the W1 and W2 aren't the output of some processing, they're actually the messages we want to transmit. Okay, so suppose we want to transmit that at the encoder. Now the encoder, and suppose we've also generated the code words like this. Now, what the encoder would like to find is a typical pair so that we get the right statistics that's inside this box. And if there's one or more, I'm happy, I will just choose one of them, right? So I'm turning the problem around. In this problem, I know there's one, but I don't want more than one. And now I turn the problem around and ask, well, I'd like to choose, rather than not choosing it too big, I wanna say, I wanna choose it not too small to guarantee there's at least one inside. And if there's more than one, I'm happy. Okay, so you're, you're, it's, it's sort of the dual problem. And in fact, what I'm interested in then is a probability of an intersection of events rather than the probability of a union. So for the Slepy and Wolf problem, we had a union error event, and because of that, it was easier to deal with. Now we're gonna have a problem of an intersection of uh, error events. And the problem is the intersection, the events in the intersection are not statistically dependent, independent. If they were statistically independent, then bounding their error probability would be easy, of course. Just take the product, or at least the first step would be easy. Okay, so what we're looking at is the following type of error probability. In, let's say, the bin corresponding to the two messages we're trying to transmit. So there's gonna, this one will correspond to W1, this bin will correspond to W2. And the error event is going to be the probability that inside this big set, v, running over all indices V1 and V2, we don't find any. Let me make it colored, the indices that we're going through. 
you don't find any uh, pair that's typical. So it's the probability that we get zero is what we're interested in rather than the probability of at most one, um, uh, two or more. So here we are interested in the probability of the union that there was another one. Here we're in the intersection so that there's none. Now the problem with this intersection is that the events inside here are generally statistically dependent. Why is that? Well, don't forget, sometimes we're, you know, going in one row and then going across, right? So if the X itself wasn't typical, then all of them aren't typical, right? So you see the dependences in there inside that intersection. We can't just treat these things independently. And that's problematic. So how do we deal with um, probabilities of intersections of dependent events? And um, so the usual trick that is used here is you use something called the second moment method um, rather than the union. But there is a way of dealing with it. Um, the, for a union, you usually use just the union bound. For something like this, we need to use um, uh, well, the, the common tool used is something called the second moment method. And maybe I can just quickly outline how the second moment method is. You heard... Can you repeat what you just said about the dependence? Oh, the dependence? Well, let's take a look at these events. Okay, so there's... We're looking over all possible boxes here, whether the pairs are, whether the pairs are um, typical or not. Now, if, if I go across these boxes, right away there's a dependence, right? Because I'm always considering the same x. So, for example, if th this x is atypical, then all of these are automatically atypical, right? So, so the, we can't treat them independently. We have to worry about all the dependencies going in this direction, that direction. Of course, if I take this pair and take that pair, which isn't in the same row and column, then they are independent, right? But the trouble is there's a lot of dependence everywhere else. <laughs> so how do we deal with that? You see what I mean? We, we can't just make this a product. Like there, was, there were problems where we could make this a product. Remember when we dealt with um, vector quantization there, we were able to massage what was inside so that all events, it was an intersection of independent events. And then we could just take a product. Now we can't do that here, right? So you have to be careful. You, can't just do that here. The answer we will get will look like it was like a product, <laughs> but we can't do, we can't just do that. So we'll see, we'll see that happening. Okay, are there questions? Any other questions? But we're, okay. I mean, th this is the coding method we will use late, a little bit later. This is called, again, Martin coding, multi-coding. It's one of the most standard tricks used um, it's a really interesting information theoretic tool. I, I would say today, even today, there's no real practical way of doing this. Okay, but you know, in, in principle, we can think of how to do it. So, you know, finding a practical method of doing this is still a very interesting open problem. Okay, and you heard. So the tool that's used to deal with this in the easiest way, I think, is what you heard two days ago. You heard, you know, if you don't know what to do, use indicator functions. <laughs> That's, the, I think, the easiest way to approach this problem, too. So I'll, let me just outline it. I, I don't, don't want to go through the steps, all of them, but I, just to give you an idea, I, I want to show you where, that there's a problem. And the way we usually deal with this is, um, sec is something called the second moment method. And what the second moment method does is it basically uses Chebyshev's inequality in a, you know, somehow you try to link this problem to Chebyshev's inequality. That's why the sec where the second moment comes in, right? Because Chebyshev's inequality uh, deals with second moment. Okay, so uh, let me just quickly outline it. So let's introduce these integrator functions. So suppose this here is the indicator random variable that takes on the value one if this thing is typical. Uh, so here W1 is fixed, of course, W2 is fixed, uh, is typical. And um, zero otherwise, of course, so if it's atypical. Okay, so that's my indicator random variable. And then we define a sum. 
be just the sum over all V1, V2 of these indicators. Right? And what we, if this sum here is zero, so the sum being zero is the same thing um, as this event happening, right? Because if the sum here is zero, then all of them are atypical. And if the sum is not zero, then that event, then there is one typical. So the sum being the event, so the event S equals zero is the same as that intersection over there, right? It's the same thing as this event, right? So that's the main trick, right? We're, we're, we're making something that looks complicated. We're making it look simple, namely giving it a number, and now we can deal with it using, like, as if it was a real number than just a set, you see? So that's sort of the, or, or object with typicality. That's the main trick is just to simplify the uh, manipulation. Okay, now we can talk about the second moment of S. That's where the word second moment comes from. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, S bar is the expected value of S. That's a random variable. This is a random variable. This is a random, um, well, that's a number. <laughs> then we can talk about the variance of S, of course, is just the expected value of S squared minus S bar squared. That's the usual stuff. And now we use um, Chebyshev's inequality for this problem, or Markov. Well, we can, you know, Chebyshev can be derived from the Markov inequality. So the PB bin, this thing here, E, is the same thing as uh, W1, W2, is the same thing as the probability that S equals 0. We've already seen that, right? S equals zero is the same as that event. So the error probability is just the probability that S is equal to zero. Now the event S equals zero implies that um, S minus S bar squared, I just write it in a funny looking way, but that's just to get to Chebyshev's inequality, right? So if S is zero, then clearly S squared is greater than or equal to S squared. So this thing, since this implies that, that means the event has larger probability. So that means that S bar squared less than or equal to S bar squared. And now I can use Markov's inequality to write, right, this is a positive valued random variable. This is just a number. So I'm just using the Markov inequality to say that's less than or equal to the variance of S by S bar squared. Okay, and there's my bound. So if I can prove that this number here, so the second moment, looking at the, the, sec the variance of S and dividing by the square of the mean goes small, then the error probably gets small. Okay, so that's the, that's the second moment method. If I now compute this, the variance of S, it's not too hard to do that, right? We take the square of the indicator function and take expectations. Then it turns out it has the following form. Uh, maybe I start with S bar. S bar we can show is approximately 2 to the n r1 prime plus r2 prime uh, 2 to the minus n i x y. And if you compute the variance of S, you'll find that this is approximately equal to 2 to the n r1 primed plus r2 primed. Uh, uh, be careful here. It, it's, it has a funny sh looking shape. 2 to the minus n i x y plus, there's some extra terms, 2 to the n r1 primed plus 2 to the n r2 primed, uh, 2 to the minus 2 n i x y. And now if we take this variance, divide it by this squared, what you'll see is that this is approximately equal to uh, 2 to the, so this is going to be approximately 2 to the minus n r1 primed, r2 primed, 2 to the n i x y, plus some extra terms that are 2 to the minus n r1 primed, plus 2 to the minus n r2 primed. I'm just writing it out quickly. Um, now, these terms here will disappear if R1 prime and R2 prime are positive. Let's just assume they're positive. And 
look at what happens to make things small, I have to have R1 prime plus R2 primed being bigger than the mutual information. Okay, so what we get out of all of this is in terms of the size of this box that we, I just erased, right, the size of this box, which has size 2 to the n r2, 1 prime, and this 2 to the n r2 prime, what we have to have to guarantee there's at least one jointly typical pair inside is r1 prime plus r2 prime greater than i x y. Remember, to guarantee there was at most one inside, we had to have less than. Now it just switched around. Okay, so it's, it's a very nice result. It shows you that on one side we have to make the box, the area of this box, um, um, the area of the box of course is just this, right? We have to make it bigger than this. In the other case, we have to show that the area of the box is less than this. Okay, so it flips around. Very, very useful result. Okay, and this is called multi-coding, Martin coding, um, and so on. Okay, is it clear? At least generally. <coughs> Sir, uh, in this S bar is equal to expectation of S. Yes. That let, yeah, yeah. Expectation of this, yeah. Sir, S is a number. S, S is, is a number. A number. Yes. And the expectation of a number will be the expectation of the same thing. Yes. So, well, no, uh, how, no, uh, how will we calculate the well, variance of a number? Uh, well, s is a random variable. I mean, it's a number, but it's a random variable. That value, it, so it's a fun, if you want to be formal, it's a random variable that's a function that evaluates to a real number. In fact, it evaluates to an integer here because these are all zeros and ones. Right, so s is a random variable because this is an indicator is a random variable, right? And since this is a random variable, we take a sum of random variables, this is a random variable, so that I can take its expectation. In fact, you can easily do it. The expectation of s is just the sum of the expectation of, the, of these, and the expectation of each of these is just each element here individually, you see? So we've gotten rid of the intersection by converting the intersection into a sum. That was the main trick. Because we'd like to deal with things individually rather than, and so we have to get to a sum. So there's two ways of getting a sum: a union through the union bound, that's obvious. So we get and here we're, we're converting to indicator functions, and then we get sums, and we can again treat every object individually. That's the main trick. I mean, when you see it, it's kind of simple, but it turns out to be a very general tool that's often used for combinatorial problems. So if you look up, there's a nice book on the combinatorial something, Spencer and something, anyway, it's a popular book, I think it's one of, one of the main chapters deals with the second moment method there, too. uses similar steps, okay? So anyway, you should see where this bound comes from right away. <laughs> That's just the sum, and this is the mutual information, because what's the probability that if x and y are chosen independently that they happen to be typical? That's just 2 to the minus n mutual information. So th this one's easy. Uh, doing the variance just takes a little bit more work because we're getting, you know, the square of this. <laughs> and then we get i times i, and sometimes that thing is zero. A lot, a lot of stuff disappears, but then there's three terms remaining. This one, this one, this one, and this one. But anyway, once you have all that, you just plug it in and you see, oh, this, this number actually goes down exponentially fast as long as this quantity is satisfied. And that's all, that's what I needed. Okay? It's just important to realize you can't use union bounds, so it's not as simple, the proof. Good, so then I think it's time for a break, and then we'll, can, we'll I'll use that later today. Uh, not right away, but 